Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this session that will focus on destination six of the Horizon Europe Cluster 5 work program. Uh, my name is uh, Dimitrios Vautis, and I'm a policy officer at DigiMove, uh, the European Commission's Directorate General for Mobility and Transport. Um, I will be the moderator in this session, uh, and I will also be joined by um, other colleagues here from the Commission who will present in more detail individual topics uh, in this part of the uh, Cluster 5 work program. Now, in this session, in destination six, we will be focusing on research and innovation for safe, resilient transport and smart mobility services for both passengers and goods. This area will have a major contribution uh, to the decarbonization and digitalization of mobility and transport, delivering on the European Union Sustainable and Smart Mobility Strategy, the European Green Deal, the digital transition, and uh, other EU priorities. In particular, we will be presenting uh, here today a total of 10 topics addressing the areas of logistics with two topics, one topic in the area of infrastructure, as well as uh, safety and resilience uh, with seven topics in that area. All of these actions together are bringing forward a major uh, European Union budget contribution for a total amount of 127 million euros. Now, let me also remind you that aside from this information session, the full detail on all these topics, the precise scope of work, uh, deadlines and other conditions are all laid out in uh, the full text of the work program. And in fact, that will, be, that will be the basis for elaborating, but also for evaluating uh, proposals. In particular, uh, please pay attention to the precise deadline that is set for each individual call topic. Uh, for instance, uh, the topics on logistics and infrastructure have a deadline in October this year, while the topics on safety and resilience have deadlines either in October of this year or in January 2022. Now, uh, before we proceed, uh, please note that at the end of all the presentations, there will be a questions and answer session. Uh, and for that, uh, please put your questions in writing uh, through Slido. And uh, you should be able to, to have the link there as we speak. Uh, and of course, aside from this session, uh, there is also an opportunity to submit written questions uh, and of course receive written answers through the research inquiry service uh, on the uh, funding and tenders portal. Uh, finally, for your information, uh, this session is being recorded and all the information that will be presented as well as all the slides will be made available online after the event. Uh, but okay, let us proceed now and uh, let me already uh, introduce our uh, speakers. We will start with Paola Chiarini, who is a policy officer also here at DigiMove, and she will present the two topics in the area of logistics. After that, my colleague Rafael Stanetsky, policy officer from DigiMove, will present the topic on infrastructure. Following that, my other colleague, Georgios Jamalis, policy officer from DigiMove also, will present five topics on safety and resilience. And finally, uh, Ronald Vopel, uh, policy officer from DG Research and Innovation, will present two topics dedicated on waterborne transport, safety and resilience. So without further ado, uh, I would like to thank you once again for joining this session. And let me now pass on the floor to the first speaker, Paola Chiarini. Paula, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dimitris. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, what I'm going to present today is two logistics uh, uh, topics. The first one, uh, the topic 0107, is on more efficient and effective multimodal freight transport nodes, whereby nodes we have a quite a large um, meaning. It, this can include ports, airports, uh, inland terminals, inland um, hubs, so quite a large uh, definition. 
Um, the proposals, uh, um, the project will be innovation actions, which means that the proposals will have to provide uh, both research and demonstration at quite high TRL level. Um, the proposals, uh, the work will focus on three main areas. And please remember that for all the three areas, the proposals will have to build on previous project results and also on existing activities. Uh, for instance, like since we talk about digitalization on the work of the Digital Transport and Logistics uh, Forum. So what is the scope of the, uh, pro of the proposals? The proposals under the first uh, area of work, the proposal will have to demonstrate and quantify the benefits of both using different intermodal transport units and innovative automated loading systems, really to support multimodal logistics operations. The proposals can also develop further the standardization strategies about these units, for instance, taking into account count different uh, logistics operators, different uh, transshipment procedures or technologies, um, really for to increase the flexibility and the efficiency and the sustainability of the freight transport system. Since the standardization has an international, well, global reach, international cooperation on these aspects is really um, encouraged. On the second, uh, um, under the second area of work, the proposals will have to um, deploy and demonstrate advanced cooperative logistics IT solutions in an actual operational environment, which means minimum TRL 7. And the proposals will have to focus to deploy these solutions, focusing on the better integration of uh, better integrating the nodes into the overall supply chain and increasing accessibility and usability of the node services in an automated and digital manner. All these have to be done under a user perspective approach, meaning that we are not looking for new IT platforms to be developed. Now all these um, uh, deployed IT solutions uh, um, should increase, uh, provide full visibility to the standard services provided in the node, provide better estimated and actual times of arrival and departure through track and trace, real time track and trace, provide automated decision support system functionalities, really to optimize the supply chain performance and also uh, to improve uh, uh, the resilience against disruptive events like what could be a pandemic. But also these IT solutions have to ensure um, compatibility with existing legacy systems, have to ensure resilience of data in case uh, really of malicious or uh, accidental interventions, have to address data ownership, confidentiality, governance, and access rights. And under the third stream of work, the proposals will have to demonstrate the effectiveness of new business models and collaborative approaches mainly business models approaches and approaches based on the IT solutions deployed under the second um, areas of work. And all this is really to uh, support cooperative logistics uh, operations. The business model should so consider legal constraints and uh, appropriate frameworks for collaborative and collaborative uh, um, environment. And based on the deployment of these new business models, uh, they will have to identify concrete legal barriers and regulation at both European and national level that are hampering the adoption of these models and have to prepare proposed solutions and policy recommendations. Next slide, please. Um, what do we want from uh, what do we want to achieve from these proposals? First of all, uh, the expected outcomes are a more efficient, effective, and sustainable management of goods and freight flows in all these uh, um, all these um, multimodal nodes. And this has to be done taking into account all the type of cost of the proposed solutions and innovations, including um, externalities and rebound effects, and should be done not only from the economic point of view, but also from a social and environmental point of view. We are expecting also an expanded throughput through these nodes, thanks mainly to operational efficiency and optimized use of assets and infrastructure, but without expanding the physical facilities. We want to see an improved access to transshipment services at reduced cost, 
and more visible and standardized services to provide really to create um, a seamless door-to-door uh, -door freight transport and tracking of, uh, of goods. And everything is to have more efficient and sustainable freight transport um, um, logistics. We want to see increased automation, digitalization, standardization, interoperability in, in various sectors. And all of these are for a better integration of the nodes in a sustainable um, overall logistics chains. Next slide, please. Next, please. Thank you. Um, so the proposals, the projects will be innovation actions, as I mentioned. We consider that a EU contribution between seven and eight million euros should be appropriate for these type of proposals. And the deadline for submission is 19th of October. Next slide, please. Okay, the um, next topic relates more to urban logistics. And the topic 0108 is actually focuses on new delivery methods and business and operating models to green the last mile and optimize road transport. Um, also in this case, the proposals will be uh, innovation actions, which means that cover research, demonstration, pilot activities. What is covered by the scope? Um, the proposals will have to address both methodological and technical vehicle aspects of cargo bikes. The idea is really to optimize the last mile deliveries, to see where cargo bikes have more potential, more benefits for which areas, for which kind of goods, for which kind of chains, and how the um, use of these cargo bikes uh, can be replicated across several cities. Proposals will have to consider demonstrating also other cleaner modes or generally cleaner modes for the last mile transport vehicles. We are talking about, uh, for instance, electric assisted two, three, four wheel cycles, while at the same time testing innovative tools like they could be dynamic routing, load policies, parcel lockers. And also the proposals will have to measure their effects on reducing empty uh, miles and congestion. Um, proposals will have to pilot cooperation with private logistics operators, with local businesses, and to establish new models for addressing governance and management of these logistic operations, both in urban and in the peri-urban areas. And the idea is really to achieve um, more cost efficient and um, scale up the potential of all these innovative solutions. Next slide, please. Um, the proposals will also have to evaluate in a qualitative and quantitative way the effectiveness of proposals and measures uh, implemented at local level. They will have to identify and evaluate possible barriers to the uptake and deployment of these innovative solutions and proposal solutions in case there are these barriers. Also, it's important that the um, knowledge in these, um, in these proposals allows to draw um, lessons, common lessons to, uh, to these other topics funded under similar areas. So the proposal will have to present several mechanisms for this and will have to cooperate and work with the Civitas initiative. The proposals may, uh, if they consider interesting, use preparatory, take up replication actions, research activities, and they can also consider tools to support local planning and policy making. For instance, uh, proposals uh, should demonstrate contribution to implementing the city's sustainable urban mobility plans. And if, if uh, um, a sustainable urban logistic plan is not already in place, the city can develop one or a similar tool. The proposal should also consider to collaborate with the Civitas initiative and contribute to social sciences and humanities, um, and a contribution of social sciences and humanities, as well as social innovations. Next slide, please. Um, what we expect from these proposals? Um, these proposals uh, should really support the take up and the upscale of these um, innovative last mile solutions, so solutions that are um, best practice, uh, that can be re replicable, safe, sustainable, 
And all these have to be done in living labs in the cities. The proposal will should have at least three living labs, so three demonstrator cities and three follower cities. And at least one of these living labs and follower cities have to be located in areas experiencing rapid economic and social change. This could be, for instance, um, areas with uh, urban sprawl, this, the densification, or on the opposite side, depopulation, for instance, or even areas where um, there is really a lack of innovative measures. Proposals will have to develop logistics hubs and micro consolidation center. Um, cooperating with the local authorities to select the proper appropriate location in line also with the urban policy, um, mobility policy of the city. They have to test and deploy new delivery methods in at least three cities. They have to optimize urban space, loads, reduce empty miles through dynamic uh, um, routing, so through innovative tools uh, like uh, load policies, um, uh, urban parcel lockers, and so on. They have to demonstrate cost efficient um, zero emission modes and solutions for the last mile transport for urban and peri-urban deliveries through these living labs. And they have also to improve the knowledge of user needs, habits and preferences uh, so that um, this information can be shared with uh, uh, public authorities and private companies. Next slide, please. The proposals also in this case are innovation actions. Uh, we consider that EU contribution between seven and eight million also in this case it would be appropriate for these type of proposals. And that line is the 19th of October. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dimitris. I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you very much, uh, Paola, uh, for this uh, indeed excellent overview of the logistics topics. Uh, addressing also urban logistics uh, and all of this, of course, coming together with a total uh, EU budget contribution of 30 million euros, uh, which is also quite significant. Uh, so thank you for that. Now, uh, let us proceed uh, with the area of uh, infrastructure. Um, and here I would like to pass the floor to my colleague, uh, Rafael Stanetsky, to present the uh, 2021 topic on uh, climate resilient and environmentally sustainable transport infrastructure uh, with a focus on inland waterways. Uh, so, Rafael, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dimitris. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Um, uh, I would like to present this uh, only topic uh, uh, on transport uh, infrastructure. And uh, that's why it's that's why it's very important one. Uh, first of all, I would like to maybe say a uh, few words why it's a particular focus on on inland waterways. Uh, there are two reasons for that. Uh, the first reason is the inland waterways are particularly vulnerable to climate change to changing uh, water levels to uh, excess or to uh, uh, not sufficient uh, uh, water levels. Uh, the other reason is that we have had uh, recently four topics uh, related to climate resilience for land infrastructure. So uh, we thought that um, waterways were a bit uh, left left over so left behind that's why it, um, this topic uh, has a particular focus on inland uh, waterways and this topic also uh, falls into the commission policy uh, on climate re change re re resilience uh, we're not talking only about uh, emission reduction but uh, this is the other side. This is the adaptation to the changes which are inevitable, which are uh, taking place uh, already now. Let me start with uh, scope. Uh, thank you. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, transport infrastructure is uh, vulnerable to climate change, uh, natural, but also human caused uh, disruptions. 
uh, the goal of the topic is to strengthen uh, infrastructure reliability, um, improve its performance and resilience of the entire transport system. So in the end, we looking to climate resilient infrastructure system, but at the same time, uh, smart, green, sustainable with uh, biodiversity and biodiversity uh, friendly. The solutions uh, proposed uh, should uh, mm, ensure the performance of in inland waterways uh, during periods of uh, low or high water levels. For the land transport, we are looking for uh, solutions uh, uh, assuring uh, performance and safety of uh, land transport and ports it's concerning this the uh, sea uh, infrastructure uh, we are also looking for a state-of-the-art solution for surveillance and predictions of climate uh, change effects uh, while at the same time using sustainable materials and construction techniques Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I would like to mention uh, the four projects which been recently um, financed, which are still uh, on ongoing on land uh, uh, infrastructure uh, land transport infrastructure resilience these are resist for c safeway and panoptis horizon 2020 projects which already um, give some input and uh, the future um, proposals should be based uh, on this uh, on the work that's uh, been uh, already done um, continuing with the uh, scope, yes, um, excuse me, yes, um, the last three points uh, concern uh, of uh, solutions to resilience of the uh, uh, transport infrastructure. So we are looking for a design of uh, standard modular infrastructure elements, which can be rapidly deploy deployed because uh, time is offer, uh, often very short um, in the case of disruptive events. Uh, we are looking for new governance models to enable enhanced cooperation across institutional, model and uh, national boundaries, stakeholders. And the last uh, point uh, concern, um, last but not least, uh, of course, uh, uh, solutions contributing to lowering the environmental footprint uh, uh, resources and material consumption. Uh, in the topic call, uh, you will see uh, the list of uh, uh, relevant EU regulations which have to be uh, respected uh, in this uh, uh, respect uh, what concerns environment. Uh, the proposals uh, should uh, include uh, at least two pilot demonstrations in operation environment and we are uh, looking into minimum trl7 on safe corridors and one should be uh, specific for inland waterways and the, the second could also incorporate uh, uh, um, hinter hinterland uh, infrastructure which is connected to uh, uh inland waterways infrastructure next one please the outcome uh the outcome we our goal was to um uh, to assure the 
um, capacity, the, the minimum capacity levels. Uh, and for inland waterways, uh, we would like to see at least 50% uh, capacity level um, uh, assured. For land sea infrastructure, we are talking about of 80% capacity to be uh, so much uh, stronger condition. Uh, we would also like to see at least 20% um, model shift. We would like to uh, see uh, both passenger mobility and uh, freight uh, transport res uh, resilience and smooth uh, functioning. Of course, we, we, with relations to the um, uh, transport infrastructures. Uh, we would also like to uh, see um, use of recycled materials to the at the level of at least uh, 30 percent and uh, with the principles um, uh, of circular economy reduced uh, environmental impact during construction maintenance operation and decommissioning so the whole uh, life cycle of the infrastructure should be uh, looked uh, into and the last slide please um, this is in, in innovation action. That's why TRL uh, 7, uh, the EU contribution per project uh, uh, is up to 7.5 million. Uh, so with the total budget of 23 million, we hope to be able to finance uh, three uh, projects. And the deadline is uh, in line with uh, other uh, topics uh, of this call. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. Could I maybe just ask you one very quick clarification if possible? Uh, we have a question here in the chat. If you could kindly please repeat the names of the projects, uh, finance on land transport infrastructure. You mentioned something to that end. So, if you could only just clarify this one, please. Uh, of course, uh, the projects uh, which I mentioned were uh, Resist, 4C, Safeway and Panoptis. And not because I know them by heart, but I'm reading them from the printed uh, uh, Horizon Europe uh, work program. And I'm on the page uh, 404 of the program. Uh, so you will find them as a footnote number 255. Thank you very much, uh, Rafael, uh, for that detailed uh, answer. Um, all right. So um, indeed, that is uh, indeed an important area uh, for further research and innovation, the area of infrastructure. And as you mentioned here again, we're providing a significant uh, contribution from the EU side. Uh, with a total budget of 23 million euros for this topic so okay so let me thank you once again uh, for that presentation and now um, i would like to uh, pass the floor to my colleague uh, georgios jamalis uh, to present uh, five topics in the area of safety and uh, resilience uh, which are included in the calls uh, for this year in 2021 uh, but also for uh, the call in 2022 uh, so, Georgios, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, th uh, thank, uh, thank you Dimitris. So, uh, actually, as Dimitris said, we're going to present five topics, though there are uh, on, on two different modes of transport. Uh, road transport will be the first uh, series of topics, and then will be uh, uh, aviation, uh, road safety will be the first uh, uh, three topics, and the other two will be aviation safety. And then afterwards, uh, our colleague uh, Ronald Vopel will present the waterborne safety topics. So. Uh, I will start with the topic. Uh, first slide, please. Okay. So, so, so the first uh, the first topic I'm going to present is this is a topic on testing uh, safe light light uh, weight vehicles and improved safe human technology interaction in the future traffic uh, system. This topic has two distinct areas, and the proposals uh, are invited to to address 
uh, one of them. Okay, so the, if, if we go to the first area, which is the testing safe uh, lightweight vehicles, uh, we have the rationale behind it is that the automotive safety has uh, significantly progressed in the last decades, thanks to advanced modeling, testing capabilities, and new structure, and uh, as well as the introduction of uh, active safety. Nevertheless, uh, in order uh, to put uh, this in place, uh, we are asking to, via this topic, to perform uh, advanced testing on crash, toughness, fracture, and fatigue of new materials for, for vehicles, to analyze the crash scenarios of the future, take into consideration active safety devices, but also their potential failure. Uh, also to address standardized positions for crash absorbing elements and, uh, and demonstration of a minimum number of crash tests that is uh, designed to validate virtual testing for a large number of uh, different uh, scenarios. And uh, this is the scope, let's say, of, uh, for, uh, for area A. For area B, which uh, refers to the safe human uh, technology interaction, the future transport system, something that is uh, quite uh, essential because um, another challenge, uh, uh, the, the increasing, let's say, role of human machine interface is uh, the human machine interface play in the, uh, and their integration in the, in the vehicle it has uh, some um, uh, effects on, uh, on road safety. So what we're asking here is uh, to design and, and develop an intuitive, understandable, non distracting and reliable adaptive interface for human technology interaction in the road vehicles uh, that requires a minimal amount of training for the safe user for the driver to develop concepts of external interfaces that are uh, also taking into consideration the characteristics like uh, speed, uh, direction, and, uh, and all these that are possible to interpret and understand by all your road users. To understand the long-term effects, physical and mental, the potential risk and possible benefits for road users exposed to and actively using adaptive human massive interface technologies. And to propose means to improve or maintain road user performance in terms of safety. And to develop safety validation methods for uh, the new adaptive uh, HMI technologies. The, the outcomes of each uh, areas, the expected outcome of each area are respectively for the, for the vehicles, for the testing uh, safe lightweight vehicles uh, are safe, safer, but also lighter and circular vehicle structures, uh, advanced vehicle concepts with higher compatibility between vehicles of different sizes and masses in the similar crashes, advanced structural designs, tolerance to a wide uh, set of crash angles, and uh, improved safety in future mixed traffic scenarios, including an increasing number of automated vehicles. For uh, the human machine interface uh, area, the expected outcomes are reduced driver distraction as an important factor in road crashes, intuitive and unobtrusive information of drivers and other road users about expected actions at any time, Safer mobility for all for lower, for lower, all road users, including the ones with impaired mental and or physical capacity. The availability of human-centric adaptive interfaces and positive stimulation and utilization of human abilities by new human te technology interfaces and the improved validation methods for um, human machine interface. Both, uh, both actions, both proposed actions have a TRL levels between five and six. The EU contribution is estimated, the indicative EU contribution is, is estimated to be between 3.5 to 4 million per proposal. And the total budget of this topic is 12 million euros. So we expect to fund the three proposals. Uh, the deadline is set on 19th of October. Now we we'll move to the second, uh, to the second uh, topic which is the radical um, improvement of road safety in, uh, in uh, low and medium count counters in Africa. So uh, the rationale behind it is that uh, essentially the, that there is an increase of uh, projection that the, the, the road uh, 
the road crashes in Africa are, are due to increase over 25% in the next two years and already four times more than, the, than in Europe. Therefore, the idea is to use uh, uh, the know-how that we have in Europe in order through international cooperation actions to contribute to safer roads in Africa. So the, the, the scope of this uh, project is uh, in-depth road accident investigations in selected areas in African countries in order to find evidence of the underlying contributing factors behind the accidents, to develop an innovative approach to promote the safe system approach in selected uh, African countries, to analyze the most appropriate road safety assessment methodologies and traffic management system, as well as protection principles for the vulnerable road users and vehicle occupants, as well as define criteria for measuring future progress, to identify requirements for skill, de for skill development and training of staff and research and innovation needs with a view to quick deployment of suitable solutions, to design, develop, and implement a series of small scale pilot demonstration projects to test the imp implementation of a safe system approach at different levels, to carry out an evaluation and assessment of the pilot demonstration projects, to define guidelines detailing, detailing requirements and propose recommendation from the small scale pilot demonstration, useful for the implementation of a safe system approach to be upscaled for the African con continent. And what we expect, the expected outcome of, uh, of these actions should be to contribute to the global target of 50% fewer road fatalities and serious injuries by 2030 in low to medium income countries in Africa. To contribute to implementing the recommendation of the road safety cluster of the African EU Transport Task Force that was adopted in 2020. To have more effective uh, design of road safety pra uh, practices, measures, and policies in the targeted countries, and establishment of the safe system approach in national road safety strategies. An, an improvement of uh, road safety and traffic fluidity conditions in Africa, ultimately saving thousands of lives and lessening the human, social, and economic burden of road accidents. And the reinforcement of indigenous African capabilities with a view to long term sustainable progress in the fight against road casualties and for a more efficient and sustainable transport system. This is a, again a research innovation action with a TRL level five to six. With a, the indicative budget is 4 million euros per proposal and with a total EU contribution budget for this topic set at 8 million euros. The deadline is the 19th of October. We move now to the third topic on uh, road safety, which is set for 2022. And it refers to the, it has again two different, two distinct parts. So proposals are invited to address either one of them. And uh, with the first area being the predictive safety assessment framework, which uh, the predictive safety assess assessment framework will support uh, considerably the proactive management of road safety as an important as an important principle of a of a road safety system. So the scope of this uh, action is the development of new methods to efficiently to efficiently predict the effects of the implementation of a new technology, new means of transport, and regulatory or behavioral changes on road safety up to the le level of socioeconomic benefits. A further development and validation of virtual modes of the relevant elements of the transport system for which such further development is most urgently needed. An analysis on how the application of new technology and or the introduction of a new regulation will affect the remaining road safety burden and how traffic and crash scenarios will change with their market penetration and or enforcement respectively. The second area on, um, on, the, on, on this topic refers to the safer urban environment for vulnerable road users. I have to say that the vulnerable road users who have been funding through Horizon 2020 to several projects on the, on, uh, in the past. And this will be, let's say, uh, the project that should, uh, the future action should take into consideration what's the outcome of the previous projects. So what, what is the scope of this um, area? 
is a safer inclusion of new means of transport into the, uh, into the uh, traffic system. The protection, new means of transport, meaning like the, the e scooters that have recently appeared, appeared and uh, so on. The protection principles and solutions to provide a safe environment for vulnerable road users. Protective equipment, helmets, clothes, reflectors, that is innovative, effective, user friendly, and likely to lead to higher usage rates. Improved in detection mechanisms of vulnerable road users by other users and accurate predictions of their behavior, included in particular at uh, road intersections. An analysis of the most common causes of accidents concerning vulnerable road users and demonstration of applied solutions. Probably to provide clear guidance to cities and member states or, or associated countries on how to incorporate the vulnerable road user dimension into infrastructure planning and sustainable urban mobility plans, especially for the aspects of safety and accessibility. What is now the expected income for, uh, for the first area? It will be harmonized prospective assessment framework for road safety, both active and passive, and solutions for policy, regulatory, and consumer assessment. A comprehensive visual, virtual representation of challenging scenarios in future road uh, traffic, and the well-founded prognosis on the effect of new solutions on road safety and protection of vulnerable road users and vehicle occupants. For the second area, there will be 50% reductions in serious injuries and fatalities in road crashes by 2030, with a focus on measures addressing unprotected vulnerable road users, a better prediction of all road users' behavior, and the use of new transport modes. Concepts and guidelines for safe inclusion of new types of vulnerable road users, e.g., those like those using new means of transport in the traffic system. Development of solutions that facilitate inclusion of all vulnerable users in the transport system. And the facilitation of modal shift to active and clean modes of transport. Again, once again, uh, the type of actions are uh, re research innovation actions with TRL between five and six. Uh, the total, total uh, budget for this topic is 13 million uh, euros, and uh, an indicative budget will be between four and 4.33 million euro per proposal. This is a 2022 topic, and the deadline is the 12th of January 2022. Now, we'll move now to another uh, mode of transport, the aviation safety, with a topic that on uh, safe automation and human factors in aviation intelligent in integration and assistance. The scope is that the, the activities now should uh, address a, new, a renewed safety focus on the teaming between the human and automation, given the steady increase in automation and aviation operations at large. Uh, for example, in the COP kit, air, air traffic controllers, the maintenance zone. And the scope will be to better understand and anticipate why incidents happen, the triggering, what are the trigger events and hazards, the cognitive failures, and the challenging, the challenges at the human machine interface. More focus should be on the human digital interface design and on integrating AI into human crews and teams. And the proposals uh, may include the explicit commitment from the European Aviation Safety Agency to assist or to participate. The expected outcome. All these uh, new technologies that develop uh, they should uh, de deliver an improved monitoring of human performance, system performance, and external hazards, intelligent assistance in all safety critical situations allowing fallback response in case of severe system perturbations, a qualification and training tools and methods to maintain high standards of safety and resilience, and organizational and regulatory preparedness, safety culture, and societal acceptance in the advent of more automation in aviation. This is a research innovation action with an EU 
contribution between four and eight million and the total budget of 12 million. The red line is 14th of September. And we'll move now to the last uh, topic uh, that I'm going to present, which is uh, another it's a 2022 topic on more resilient aircraft and increased survival survivability. Okay, the scope is that the activities should contribute to maintain a high level of safety in aviation by encompassing the evolution of external hand hazards with the evolution of aviation systems. In particular, we expect them to increase the ability to predict and avoid or mitigate weather, has uh, weather hazards, uh, to advance systems and methods for reliable aircraft tracking and the safe evacuation, search and rescue of passengers and crew, including with new aerial means such as drones. And the proposals may include the explicit commitment from the European Aviation Safety Agency to assist or participate. The expected outcome is that projects, uh, the results of these projects are expected to contribute to two or more of the following expected outcomes in order to contribute to flight path 2050 safety goals. Near uh, real uh, time proactive prediction, detection, communication, and avoidance, mitigation of anomalies and hazards at the airport, such as on the run in the atmosphere, like uh, extreme weather phenomena, and on board, such as fire, electromagnetic interference, structural issues, including self protection and improved safety modeling and design of aircraft and airports to increase survivability. For instance, in a case of fire, crash, ditching, including impact of new fuels or energy systems. And improved means and methods for reliable tracking of aircraft and timely evacuations, search and rescue of passengers and crew. Again, the, the total budget is 9 million with an EU contribution between uh, four to eight million euros per proposal. And the deadline is set for 12 January, 2022. And on behalf of uh, of uh, the RTD and, uh, and uh, DGRTD and DG Move teams, so I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Jorgo. Uh, for uh, this uh, detailed overview of the uh, five topics in the area of uh, safety and resilience. Uh, and indeed, alongside our uh, EU political objectives on the European Green Deal and on digitalization, uh, safety and resilience uh, are also clearly of uh, paramount importance for mobility and transport. Uh, we have, of course, a vision zero for road transport, but also for the other uh, transport modes. Um, and that is indeed why we're also providing the substantial uh, budget contribution from the EU uh, for a total amount of 54 million euros uh, in this area. Um, if I may uh, only um, possibly cor correct one reference that was made to one of the deadlines for uh, topic uh, D60113 from the 21 call. The deadline is not in September, but in October 21, on the 19th of October. But as I said earlier on, uh, indeed, the, the, the war program itself uh, clearly lays out all the uh, details, all the deadlines, and all the conditions associated to each topic. So uh, please refer to, uh, to, to that war program text uh, for uh, all the, uh, the clarified information. Um, OK, well, thank you again, uh, Jorgo, for that. Uh, and finally, um, let us now also hear from uh, a last speaker, uh, Ronald Vopel from DG Research and Innovation, uh, who is going to present uh, two topics uh, and specifically addressing safety and resilience in the area of uh, waterborne transport. So Ronald, please go ahead. Uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will present two topics that are safety and resilience related in the waterborne sector. Can I have the first slide, please? 
Uh, both topics are quite, quite pertinent, as you will see, um, very much in relation to recent events. One topic is from 2021, the other will be 2022, but with an early call date. So that's why it's also presented here. The first topic I'd like to present is controlling infection on large passenger ships. We are not targeting any specific disease, but we have historical incidents as reference. the most recent one obviously being COVID, but there were others before like norovirus, Legionella. So there is a problem in large passenger ships, obviously, with the spread of contagious diseases. Uh, for this topic, we, of course, want to see also that the travel from and to the ship is compared, considered, as well as land excursions, because obviously disease vectors can come from the ship, can come to the ship, and may also relate to land-based activities during a journey. We want to stress that there is a particular problem if there are extended journeys away from land-based medical infrastructures. Now, the cruise sector in particular has been slowing down because of COVID, but there was a tendency to ever more exotic cruises, which of course can lead to medical urgencies that cannot be addressed um, with land-based means, but must be addressed on the vessel. So that's an important aspect. Two aspects are um, of particular importance here. Of course, the prevention, mitigation, and management once an outbreak has happened, or whether an outbreak should be prevented in the first place, that are ship-based management problems. The second one is the healthy ship design. How do we avoid through the design of the ship that outbreaks actually can take place? This is one of the topics in the waterborne sector that is in particularly strongly related to social science humanities, obviously. So this kind of expertise would be welcome to be included when the topic is addressed. Next slide, please. So what is the expected outcome? Well, first of all, of course, the control of the spreading within and to and from the vessel. We want to see a systematic early detection that also has to relate into crew training. So it's very important to involve the crews, the seafarers, the operators. It's not just a technical problem. It's also a behavioral and social interaction problem. The outcome should certainly be a public knowledge increase and an evidence database in order to have a reference system which can be used in the future uh, as a guidance. We want to see safer ship design and the guidance for operators. So both parts, the initial design of the vessel, uh, eventually even through retrofitting, and of course the operational patterns that are coming with this. Next slide, please. So this is a RIA. We are in the early stages in this kind of thing. Of course, we'd like to see the highest TRL possible, but currently we're aiming at TRL 5. The total budget for this topic is 8 million euro, and we have here two uh, sub-issues to be addressed, which can be addressed uh, separately or together. 3 million are earmarked and are seen as a meaningful indicative contribution for the prevention, mitigation, operational efforts that I just mentioned, and five for the ship design. The deadline is 19 October 2021, as already indicated by the moderator for these kind of topics. I now come to the next topic, which is um, more related to commercial shipping, so not so much passenger transport. It again has two subdivisions, if you wish, safer navigation and the tackling of container ship fires. The second one, clearly something that has been very much in the media only in recent weeks. So I hear the scope in two parts, first for safer navigation. We want to see a very systematic assessment of the causes, consequences, and probabilities of navigational accidents, including, of course, in particular collisions between vessels, but also between larger vessels and smaller vessels like recreational boats and fishing, um, collisions with marine mammals and floating debris, and also collisions with offshore structures, fixed structures. Uh, in addition, of course, grounding and cargo losses. These are the most common uh, navigational incidents and accidents. We want to see solutions for the most important factors, which uh, traditionally, as we know, are in particular human. Uh, we want to see automated detection and prevention, for example, in the case of collisions with marine mammals and floating debris. Uh, detection and tracking of lost containers is a very pertinent issue as they pose a navigational hazard. 
the um, uh, elaboration should be based on open source principles and common standards in order to support the interaction between vessels. So we're of course looking here at AIS and similar open standards, and in order to feed a navigational hazard database that can be universally used. The use of Galileo GNSS services is mandatory where it is possible. Next slide, please. The scope, second part, container ship fires, a systematic analysis of the courses. Uh, we have some indications like false cargo declarations, but of course that is anecdotal and not scientifically fully proven. So there is some groundwork to be done here. Uh, what are the current response measures and the potential consequences? And here we're thinking a bit about a worst case scenario, for example, a large container ship fire in a coastal area with an onshore wind. We'd like to see the full assessment of the risk from the ship design, from the cargo system, the state of the art of the firefighting equipment and the common practices, the over accident management, and of course, regulatory issues that can be then addressed on a global level in order to improve the situation. The risk control options need to be validated through tests and simulations as adequate. Uh, it is absolutely necessary in this area, as this is a public interest subject, and uh, there is of, often a response from authorities that it must be elaborated in close cooperation with the relevant um, authorities. That includes, of course, on the EU level, in particular EMSA, and we'd like to see the development of strategic plans. Communication with operators and seafarer organizations is extremely important as they will be the ones on the ground when accidents and incidents happen. So we need to see um, a systematic approach to best practice, training plans, and also practical exercises as far as that is possible within the scope of this um, topic and the budget available. Next slide, please. Expected outcome is, of course, a comprehensive understanding of the courses. A significant reduction um, long term and mid term of accident incidents through prevention, early detection, and swift responses. Um, important is a risk minimization for crews and, in particular, in sensitive areas, which means coastal zones, ports, and marine protected areas. And uh, in line with actually the digital agenda of the European Union, of course, automated systems and digital solutions are very attractive in this area in order to limit the human factor, both in the incident itself, but also in the response where mistakes can be easily made. Next slide, please. So this is an innovation action. We're looking at um, um, relatively high TRL here with seven. The overall budget is uh, 12 million euro, of which we indicatively here uh, suggest three and a half million for the safer navigation part and six million for the fire, container ship fire part, uh, in particular in light of the fact that here some simulation and testing of materials, the response systems uh, may be relatively expensive. Uh, as this is a 2022 topic, the um, deadline is the 12th January of 2022, but as this is relatively close to today, we include this here in the presentation. Uh, this leaves my presentation here. Looking forward to any questions. Thank you very much. And back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ronald, for the presentation of these uh, waterborne related topics. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this now concludes the first part of the session uh, with the presentation of all the topics. Uh, and now we will have the opportunity to address any questions you may have. Uh, let me remind you that you can post your questions in writing through Slido. And you may also vote or support uh, some questions that have already been uh, posed. Uh, and we will then be able to compile and address these questions, uh, of course, with the help of our speakers, uh, who will aim to address these questions directly in the best possible way. Uh, and finally, let me also remind you, as I mentioned earlier, that after this session, there will also be another opportunity to submit written questions and receive written feedback uh, through the research inquiry service uh, that you can find on the uh, funding and tenders portal. Uh, so let's say without further ado, let us now start uh, with these uh, questions uh, as they come in through Slido. Uh, let me already clarify uh, something that has been raised by one of the participants and uh, we should be able to see that now also here uh, in the chat uh, namely whether the uh, 
the two actions that have been mentioned here uh, by uh, our speaker Georgios on aviation safety, uh, the 2021 D6-113 and 2022 D6-17, whether these will be innovation actions. Uh, indeed, these are innovation actions. Uh, there was a type on the slides, so yes, that is right. And as I mentioned earlier, please refer again to uh, the full work program text where there you have all the full details uh, and all the conditions for each topic. Uh, let me also uh, take myself one of the questions that has come in uh, relating to uh, the topic D60110 for the call 21. It says, do I need to tackle both area A or area B or can the project tackle one only one of those topics? Uh, once again, as the, the topic is clearly laid out in the work program text, uh, the proposal should address, the project should address either area A or area B. So one or the other. Um, okay, and I hope that clarifies also. Now, um, let us turn to um, two or three questions that have come in, uh, for, particularly for the area of logistics and urban logistics. And here I would like to ask my colleague Paula uh, to, uh, to look at these questions. Um, the first question that we see there is, we see that here, Paula, can you see, can you read the question please? And, and yes, take indeed. So on the urban logistic topic, so 0108, is there any list of cities or criterion to define what is an area experiencing rapid economic and social change? Um, currently, there is not a specific definition or a specific uh, set of criteria to define this. As I mentioned during my presentation, this is the idea of urban areas that really struggle to develop themselves in well-connected uh, um, hubs, well-connected multimodal, multi-usage nodes. Uh, uh, really, the purpose is smart and clean mobility. Um, there could be different uh, trends that affect these areas, like urban growth, densification, maybe having to cope with the digitalization of activities, increasing pressure of uh, uh, freight transport or uh, um, good flows and so on. There's no specific, as I said, uh, definition at present. If um, the participants considering that is very interesting, we could make uh, provide some clarification and explanation in the participant portal so that this uh, definition is available to all the uh, potential applicants. Okay, thank you very much, Paula. Uh, there are also another couple of questions. Uh, yes, for I'll... Eight. please go ahead. Yes, I'll take them both. So it's the same topic on urban logistics. And uh, the question is, do all bullets in the scope have to be addressed by a single proposal? Um, if you go through the text of, the, of this topic, you will see that the different actions and the different activities that I mentioned in my presentation are described in different ways. So it's very clear that some activities, uh, the proposal should address some activities or could address some other activities. So, of course, what we expect, I, well, first of all, I suggest to read attentively the topics, so the, the topic text, and where the, the text mentioned that it, uh, the proposal should address something, it is expected that this part of activities is included in the text. I have to say that indeed all these element, all these elements are, all the elements are really um, interconnected, the definition, the, the development of innovative solutions, the uh, mean, well, developing proper governance with the local authorities and with the private stakeholders, evaluating the effectiveness of these measures uh, and working on communication, dissemination and replicability of scaling of solutions. But the text clearly indicates what is absolutely expected to be in the proposal and what could be in the proposal. And the following question, so always the same topic, is it a prerequisite for cities to have an SUMP for taking part in the consortiums and demonstrating the new delivery methods? Um, I would say that is not a requirement, is not requested in the text um, and is not, uh, is not compulsory. So also cities uh, which do not have an SUMPs can participate. 
thank you very much, uh, Paula. I think that's uh, quite clear. Um, let us now turn to um, a couple of questions that have come in for the topic on uh, waterborne safety and resilience uh, for my colleague uh, Ronald. Uh, there is a question here. Uh, is it prevention and mitigation or would the proposal focus on prevention measures be considered eligible? So uh, if you could please take this question and there are a couple of others uh, coming in. So maybe we can start with this one. Yes, thank you. The, um, the COVID-related, let's say, call it COVID-related topic has two parts, as you see. Uh, they can be addressed uh, separately. They can also be addressed, of course, in a larger concept together. Um, the healthy ship design, obviously, is all about prevention, uh, not making it happen. The other one addressing prevention, mitigation, and other measures, in, in my view, needs to be seen together. Um, because uh, what's the point of prevention when you have failed in the prevention, there will no 100% um, certainty ever, and then you need to move to mitigation anyway. So I would say in, an, in, a, in a broader understanding of the problem, prevention and mitigation come together. Um, un unless you really have a, a bulletproof system that it will never ever happen, I don't think that is un unrealistic to believe. Okay, Ronald, uh, thank you. There are uh, still a couple of questions uh, relating to uh, the topic D6.112. There's one uh, which says, controlling infection on large passenger ships are the following three aspects also part of the topic, food, ballast water, animals. And uh, then there are a couple of other questions, but if you can take that one, please, first. Yes, because I cannot read the other one, it needs to scroll first. Um, yes, I would say all parts um, are, are in that. I mean, we have to see this in a holistic way. Um, if a disease spreads, that is an unforeseen event, that is an unwanted event, and we would not know upfront where the source of the problem is. And we have seen in the past that uh, for certain diseases is the human interaction, for things like Legionella is rather the technical system that is to blame. So indeed, in, in, in a comprehensive way of addressing the problem, all these aspects should be covered. Now, I don't know about the animals, uh, that is certainly not a common reality on passenger ships that there are large numbers of infectious animals. But if the analysis shows, analysis shows that, I think that would need to be addressed as well, yes. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, perhaps you can also see on the screen there are another couple of questions. Uh, one is re regarding uh, safety on land. So does it mean that we need to consider safety on land for travels from to the ship as well? Or do you refer to safety accessing the vessel? So if you could just clarify that point, please. Well, uh, obviously, this, uh, this topic was drafted at a time when COVID was uh, posing a serious problem, uh, in particular to the cruise sector. And uh, as you've seen, there is an enormous economic damage already done from that. The sector is basically at standstill. Um, we have seen um, the spread of the virus from vessels, but also coming from the land side to the vessel. Now, we need to draw the line somewhere. Um, uh, what a potential passenger has done two weeks earlier will be probably not within the scope, but uh, since most cruises, for example, rely on uh, air links to the departure and the, uh, the, the final port, uh, that needs to be taken into to account in, in, in looking at the entire chain of infection. Thank you, Ronald. And one last question I see on this topic, uh, which says, since the budget is 12 million euros in total, how come the navigational safety part of the goal is expected to be around three and a half million euros? Now, <laughs> let, let me first try to understand whether this question relates indeed to, to your topic in 112. It seems to be a, a typo, but is, is that relating to your topic? Yes, I think it is. It is uh, yes, I, I understand that there are some not so straightforward mathematics in that, but as you know, all these budgets are indicative. So we accepting any kind of proposal, um, be it higher or lower, um, if it's justified. Of course, it cannot go beyond the available budget that is indicated, that is a fixed. But within the budget, we are flexible. 
So it doesn't have to be automatically deducted. If you indicate 6 million for a, to for a topic for a project and you have 12 million available, that this is automatically two projects. This can also be four projects, three projects, and that co any combination of those. Um, we are deriving these indicative figures basically from the scope, from the expectation, from the effort that we think needs to be made by the beneficiaries. Uh, if it's, for example, a demonstrator in particular, in the waterborne part, demonstrators tend to be quite expensive. Um, if you have to run simulations or real tests, uh, the cost will generally be higher. If you have to reserve time on a vessel in order to test certain solutions, uh, do onboard measurings, then costs can be higher. So it all depends in the design of the design of the project. Uh, it has to be consistent, it has to be convincing, but within that, the, the cost will be flexible. And that explains why we indicate three and a half million and, and six million, and we still come to a total of 12, because the 12 is what uh, is set in our budget, which we cannot easily exceed. Uh, for the rest, it's just uh, the question how much you justify the eligible costs ultimately. And don't forget, this is, of course, an EU contribution. The, the total of a project will always be slightly different. Thank you very much, Ronald, once again. Um, okay, uh, let us now take a break from the waterborne topic and uh, uh, look at some of the other questions that have come in uh, in relation to the topics on uh, uh, road safety in particular. Um, there is a question relating to topic uh, 21D60111, uh, which says, uh, this topic is about safer roads in Africa. Does the TRL specified refer to the, the technological readiness in Europe or in Africa? So here I would invite uh, my colleague Georgios Jamalis, please, uh, to address this question. So, Georgios, yes. please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for this question. In, uh, indeed, since the activities are focused in Africa, the TRL level by the end of the project uh, refers to, to Africa. Thank you. Yorgo for, for this. Um, let us now look through Slido. Uh, there is one more question uh, relating to the topics that you have addressed, uh, and in particular the 2021 topic D6113, which says, do all topics need to be covered in the proposals? Now here, uh, I believe we, we need to, to go back to the uh, um, to the world program text to see how this point is is clarified. Uh, let us maybe just very quickly scan through the world program if it's something that we can find this very quickly. Yorgo, in the meantime, if you are able to to provide a response, please go ahead. I think uh, I think uh, like uh, similarly to the previous uh, answer that Paula uh, has said, you know, when when it says should that it should be addressed, it should be addressed from the from the uh, work program text. Yes, indeed. Okay, thank you for this. Uh, indeed, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the work program text is, is really um, the anchor, the basis to prepare the proposals, and on the same basis that the same proposal will be evaluated. And every word has its meaning in there, uh, and whether it's a, it's uh, some of the following aspects to be addressed, or all of the following to be addressed, uh, should be addressed, or, or or will or shall be addressed. Each word really has its meaning. So uh, I would really refer um, all interested participants to please uh, review very carefully the text uh, for this topic, but also for all the others, uh, to make sure that you are really addressing uh, what is really required to be addressed in the scope of these topics. Now, uh, let us uh, look at another, a little bit more general question here, which we see on Slido. Uh, you say we can ask other questions. Can you repeat where and how? Now, I mentioned earlier that except for this session here today, uh, there is also an opportunity through the funding and tenders portal to submit uh, any questions you may have for any of the topics that you, you would like to uh, make a proposal or you have any, a question on, on any of these topics. Uh, anyone can submit a written question through the funding attendance portal. There's a dedicated section called the frequently asked questions section and any questions received in writing will also be 
uh, responded in writing. Uh, there's a dedicated service that facilitates all of this. It's called the Research Enquiry Service. Uh, so, you, you know, th there is a, there's plenty of opportunity also to use this service uh, even outside of this session. Uh, so, you know, please make sure you can also use this, uh, uh, this service uh, whenever you wish while the call is still open uh, until the day that it closes, uh, the day of the deadline. There is one last question I see here on Slido. Um, reading it, it I, can, I will read it now. Uh, it seems a bit of a general of na general nature. It says, is there any um, European-wide clear policy on benefits, grants, tax breaks, breaks for tech companies focused on biocircular economy and job creation? Now, uh, th this question clearly goes beyond the scope of, of uh, uh, the World Programme and, and this Destination 6. Uh, even even beyond um, research and innovation as such, uh, what we can say that indeed from from the European Union perspective, the European Commission, indeed a lot of emphasis is also being placed on uh, innovative uh, technology companies, on SMEs, small and medium enterprises, uh, and clearly, of course, to uh, any companies or enterprises uh, focusing on. Uh, renewable energy, clean sources of energy, uh, biodiversity, circular economy, and of course, uh, any parts of the industry that are also uh, contributing to the job creation uh, in Europe. So uh, yes, indeed, these all these elements are being uh, uh, addressed and integrated as part of all the policies that we have at the EU level. But once again, these are, I would say, uh, more horizontal, or more general um, issues that are going a little bit beyond the specific uh, topics that we're discussing here today uh, uh, in destination six uh, of the cluster five uh, world program. I would invite you once again to uh, see if you have any questions, any clarifications you wish to ask. Uh, we still have a little bit of time, so please feel free to use Slido. Uh, you have seen the, the hash code there. If there's anything else still that you would like to, to ask, please go ahead. Here are, here's the QR code and the, the hash code class five info days that you can insert uh, on Slido. If 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 there are still no further questions, if there are still no further questions, uh, then what I would like to then once again uh, say uh, in answering a previous question also is that there is still an opportunity after this session uh, to first of all to go back and uh, look at the replay uh, of the video of this session uh, with all the slides that have been presented, all the questions that have already been addressed. Uh, so, number one is that you can indeed review what we have already um, presented and talked about in this session. Um, and number two, of course, is that after this session, uh, there's also this opportunity to submit any uh, supplementary questions in writing through the research inquiry service uh, on the funding and tenders portal. So, indeed, we're, we're trying to, from our perspective, to provide all possibilities and opportunities for any questions or clarifications to be posed and so that we can answer all of these uh, in time, uh, so that in the end we have proposals that are clearly uh, taken stock and understood um, the, the content of what is in the world program, uh, the spirit also, what is it, what is there, the, the political objectives of uh, that are there behind the, the topics that have been proposed in these calls, uh, so that ultimately these, uh, these proposals are uh, are able to maximize uh, the impact and deliver as much as possible. Uh, so again, there are also these opportunities after the session to review what we said and to continue uh, to, 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 to pose any additional questions uh, that you may have. So looking at Slido once again, I don't see any further questions. That is, uh, if that is the case, then I would like to thank you all for uh, joining this session. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers, Paola, Rafael, uh, Georgios, and Ronald in this order.
of uh, the presentation you have delivered. I believe it was all quite clear. And thank you once again also for the questions that you have taken and the, the response that you have provided. Uh, and thank you, of course, to all the participants, all of you that you have joined. Uh, I hope this was a, an informative session. And at this point, I would like to wish you all the best in, in the next steps, whether it is in preparing the proposals, uh, building consortia. Uh, this is really a fascinating time now as the call is still open. So thank you also once again for being in this session and good luck as we go forward. All the best. Thank you very much to everyone. Goodbye.